Are you expecting Commissioner Geraldo today? I think so. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I'm hearing echoes. Oh, that's me. Let me Um, so today is the, um, the very first day of October, and we're going to go straight into, um, you know, I have, I have some announcements, but we're going to go straight into the community uh, planning division. Um, and after I ascertain that we have the board members present, so we do have Vice Chair Bailey present, we have Commissioner yeah. Washington present, and I see we have Commissioner Dorner present, we have our Principal Counsel David Warner present, we have our uh, Planning Director Andre uh, Checkley here present, we have our Technical Hearing Writer Marie Proctor, and we have a uh, Senior Planner over here, Kenny Flanagan, working the PowerPoints for this very long marathon day. Um, we have um, um, James Hunt on standby who, who's participating and um, so let's get started. So let me make sure we have um, Scott Rowe available and Brian Barnett Woods. So Scott Rowe, are you on? I, there he is. Can you just? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Brian Barnett Woods. I see your name, just need to hear you. Okay, so everybody's unmuted. Brian Barnett Woods, are you on? Well, while you're trying, I see your name. Let's go to Megan Reiser. Present. Wonderful. Okay, so um, while we're trying to hear Brian Barnett Woods, whose name is there, um, Scott, are you going to be the one presenting then? Who's presenting? Yes, ma'am. I'll present along with Ms. Reiser. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so we can just get started. Okay. All right. Thank you. And this is actually item 3C, and this is the planning board's um, 22nd virtual meeting since March. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the planning board. Uh, for the record, Scott Rowe with the Long Range Planning Section. I'm joined this morning by Megan Reiser with the Environmental Planning Section and Brian Barnett Woods with the Transportation Planning Section. Uh, we're here this morning to present staff's proposed six-year master planning work program for fiscal years 2022 through 2027. As you know, our most critical function is to plan for the orderly development of Prince George's County. And to do this, we must have a comprehensive program that systematically evaluates the county's planning and zoning needs, identifies the necessary master sector and functional master plans, and comprehensive zoning proposals necessary to implement Plan 2035 as strategic locations throughout Prince George's County. This program contains projects that the staff feel are necessary in the next six years to achieve that goal. Uh, the proposed projects contained in this work program reflect staff's recommendations for where in Prince George's County and what types of planning and zoning interventions are required to best achieve the vision and goals of Plan 2035. Uh, as a note, uh, as opposed to last year's program, this year's program does not include uh, studies or other planning projects that are not master plans or sectional map amendments. Uh, those projects are contained in the department's annual budget and work program. Next slide. As you know, staff in the countywide planning di division uh, e constantly evaluate and, and determine when we need to update the county's functional master plans. Uh, these master plans uh, are amended regularly as we do area master and sector plans, but sometimes uh, you need a uh, functional master plan for the entire county to update the county's policies and strategies in the areas of the environment, historic preservation, parks and recreation, transportation and mobility, or public facilities. Um, so as we uh, prepare our six-year program of area master plans and sector plans. We also work very closely with countywide planning division to ensure that we're updating our functional master plans as well. For our conference of area master and sector plans and conference zoning proposals, the long range planning section evaluates areas of the county for several factors, including our, whether or not the master plan recommendations in the current plan are still valid or possible. 
Uh, conditions change on the ground, the real estate market evolves, uh, infrastructure funding uh, practices, programs, and availability evolve. And those are, those are important to evaluate to see whether or not a plan is still viable or not. Uh, does the master sector, the current master sector plan implement the plan 2035 or, or does, it con does it have recommendations that conflict with it? The, uh, Plan 2035, as you know, was adopted in 2014. Uh, most of our master plans were approved prior to that. So we always have to evaluate those older plans to make sure that they're consistent with the current vision for Prince George's County. Um, a lot of our plans that were done, our sector plans that were done between 2000 and 2014, or 2016, I should say, are really very general policy plans that serve basically as a cover memo for a development district or transit district overlay zone. And that approach uh, has proven not to be as successful as we would have hoped over the last 20 years. And so with the 2018 zoning ordinance eliminating the development district and transit district overlay zones, we have to look at each plan to see, can this plan stand on its own? Can this plan be implemented through the zones that are being proposed in the countywide map amendment? And if not, uh, it needs to be replaced. Um, a lot of these uh, overlay zones are located in our most critical uh, general plan designated centers. Um, does the new zoning ordinance, the 2018 zoning ordinance, uh, provide new opportunities for development or preservation? Uh, the new zoning ordinance contains a lot of uh, new zoning uh, districts that, uh, excuse me, new zone types that uh, create greater flexibility and greater opportunities for mixed use development along corridors and at our designated centers. So we're looking at the plans to see if, if they align with these new zoning requirements. Um, what type of planning or zoning intervention is required? Uh, we want to not break, we don't want to break what's working. We don't want to replace valid recommendations, valid approaches, or, or valid community vision that just hasn't occurred yet. What we want to do is make it more viable and more possible for success. And so it, the projects in this program may be a minor plan amendment, uh, may be uh, an update to an existing plan, um, or may be a complete replacement. Um, and what is the effect of a, a new plan or an updated plan on the surrounding community? And how do we define the boundaries of a new plan to accommodate and address those issues and those impacts. Next slide. Currently in fiscal year 2021, we have four uh, master plans underway. We have a master plan in Bowie, Mitchellville and vicinity. Uh, we, you just initiated a sector plan for the West Heightsville, Queens Chapel area. Uh, we'll be coming to you in the coming weeks uh, to initiate a new sector plan and a sectional map amendment for the area around the Adelphi Road, UMGC, UMD Purple Line Station. Um, and uh, the transportation planning section is currently scoping out the countywide master plan of transportation update. Um, we'll be coming to you uh, next year. Uh, we'll start scoping uh, later this fiscal year, a new sector plan and SMA for the Morgan Boulevard and Brightseat Road corridor. Next slide. The first plan in the proposed uh, six-year planning work program is a minor amendment to the 2014 Southern Green Line Station Area Sector Plan. This sector plan was approved by the District Council in 2014, and it superseded the Central Branch Avenue Revitalization Corridor Sector Plan that was approved in 2013 for a significant portion of Camp Springs and the town of Morningside. What the effect of this was that the 2014, excuse me, the 2014 sector plan makes no recommendations for Camp Springs or the town of Morningside outside of a half mile radius of the Branch Avenue Metro Station. The 2013 sector plan contained a variety of community vetted market driven recommendations for the revitalization of these areas. This minor amendment would restore the 2013 sector plan recommendations for this area while retaining the recommendations in the plan for the area around the Branch Avenue Metro Station. Next slide. Over the past several years, Prince George's County and the Planning Department have engaged residents and stakeholders in the Adelphi, Langley Park, and Chillum areas in a variety of community planning efforts under the aegis of Councilmember Denny Tavares' Northern Gateway Initiative. 
We continue to work very closely with the University of Maryland and the Purple Line Coalition, the Northern Gateway Community Development Corporation, and other partners who are doing tremendous work in this area to identify strategies for these communities to sustain and thrive as the Purple Line comes online. Uh, the goal of a new master or sector plan in this area would be to pull all of that work together um, to that is, and all the work that's been done to date into a cohesive, comprehensive implementation strategy that brings Chillum, Lu Adelphi, Lewisdale, and neighboring communities into these efforts and has the legal and policy weight of an area master plan. Also, this would give us the opportunity to implement any zoning changes that come out of this effort. This effort would re replace uh, an outdated master plan from 1989 that literally predates the green, yellow, and purple lines. This document will engage the community to identify opportunities to capitalize on the work we are already doing at West Hyattsville, the Tacoma Langley Transit Center, the Ricks Road Purple Line Station, and the Adelphi Road Purple Line Stations, as well as addressing the growing impacts of redevelopment at the Fort Totten Metro Station in the District of Columbia. Next slide. In fiscal year 2023, we'll also be conducting a sectional map amendment that follows the approval of the Bowie Mitchellville and Vicinity Master Plan. Next slide. In fiscal year 2024, we hope to initiate a new sector plan and sectional map amendment for the port towns, the towns of Bladensburg, Colmore Matter, Cottage City, and Edmondston. Uh, this plan would replace the 2009 approved port town sector plan to identify updated, achievable, and realistic visions, goals, policies, and strategies for these four municipalities. 2009 sector plan was based largely on several pre-recession assumptions about the market that have proven unimplementable, and it's also overly predicated on expensive and unlikely parcel assembly. Uh, as you know, uh, many of the parcels along Annapolis Road and, and Kenilworth Avenue, uh, as well as Bladensburg Road, are sm very small parcels and the sector plan is largely predicated on someone buying up all those parcels and redeveloping them. Um, implementation of this sector plan is almost wholly dependent on its soon to be defunct development district overlay zone, which has proven over the last 11 years to be a primary barrier to re redevelopment in the Port Towns area. The replacement of the mixed use transportation oriented zone along the, Mar along the Maryland 201 Kenilworth Avenue corridor and its reversion to zoning that supports the existing commercial development pattern is another area that requires a, a reevaluation of the area, partnering very closely with the town of Bladensburg and the town of Evanston, uh, and to incorporate context and market sensitive policies and strategies that ensure the success of this corridor. Um, finally, the Port Towns Neighborhood Center within Plan 2035 requires definition. Uh, the existing half mile radius includes areas outside of the port town, such as portions of the city of Mount Rainier, but does not include the Maryland 201 or Mar Maryland 450 corridors in Bladesburg and Edmonds. Next slide. Also in fiscal year 2024, we hope to initiate a sectional map amendment for the Suitland Regional Transit District. This SMA would implement the land use recommendations of Plan 2035, which designated Suitland as a regional transit district, and the 2014 approved Southern Green Line Station Area Sector Plan. Um, land uses in the critical areas of Suitland around the intersection of Maryland 218 Suitland Road and Maryland 458 Silver Hill Road uh, were design, uh, will be uh, carried forward as a legacy mixed use town center through the countywide map amendment and regulated by the 2006 Suitland Mixed Use Town Center Development Plan. This development plan does not permit the development envisioned by Plan 2034, excuse me, Plan 2035, or the 2014 sector plan. And like many other MUTC zones, has proven more of a barrier to private reinvestment in this community. Reclassification to the appropriate regional transit oriented zones within the 2018 zoning ordinance is necessary to implement the county's vision for this area. Next slide. Also in fiscal year 2024, uh, we hope to initiate a sectional map amendment for the West Hyattsville Queens Chapel area following approval of that sector plan if one is so required. Next slide.
The zoning ordinance requires the district council to update the boundaries of the military installation overlay zone following issuance of the air of an air installation compatibility use study by the Department of Defense. One such study is due in 2022 or 2023. We anticipate that this study will recommend revising the noise contour for Joint Base Andrews, which could impact which residential properties need to certify that interior noise is properly attenuated, and the high noise impact area, which could change which properties on which certain uses, such as schools and daycare centers, or are allowed or prohibited. Joint Base Andrews has, has also reached out to the department in recent weeks to discuss possible use restrictions around the Air Force's Brandywine and Davidsonville communication sites. Could the zoning ordinance be amended to include such restrictions, this SMA would implement those as well. As staff prepares this SMA, we conduct, we anticipate conducting broad community outreach to clearly explain the implications of such a rezoning to the public, especially to any of houses of worship that are affected. We do not have any information at this time to suggest that this rezoning would affect the accident potential zones, the clear zones, or the height areas of the military installation overlay zone in any way. Next slide. I'll now turn it over to Megan Reiser, who can discuss the update to the Resource Conservation Plan. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Megan Reiser, Supervisor of the Environmental Planning Section. Uh, we are seeking to initiate an update to the Functional Resource Conservation Plan uh, starting in fiscal year 2025, following the 10-year cycle, to determine whether the policies and strategies of the existing plan remain valid or if updates are needed. We plan, uh, this plan combines the related elements of green infrastructure planning and rural and agricultural conservation into one countywide functional master plan. However, for purposes of amendment, there are three functional master plans contained within the overall resource conservation plan document. The approved green infrastructure master plan serves to protect the integrity of ecological features of countywide significance. The approved agriculture conservation plan serves to address the growing demand for land for urban and rural agricultural enterprises throughout Prince George's County. The approved rural character conservation plan serves to preserve, protect, and maintain the unique character of the scenic views, historic sites, and mag magnificent landscape that are historically and culturally significant. So initiation to review the plan is proposed to begin in fiscal year 2025, and if updates are needed, the process is anticipated to be completed in fiscal year 2027. Uh, thank you. Back to you, Scott. Thank you, Megan. Next slide. As you know, the 2004 approved sector plan for the Prince George's County Gateway Arts District stands as one of the most successful planning efforts we've ever done in Prince George's County. The uh, plan has largely achieved the visions and goals to rejuvenate and revitalize the U.S. 1 corridor by creating an environment that attracted the so-called creative class to Mount Rainier, Brentwood, North Brentwood, and Hydesville. However, times have changed, and that's largely due to the success of this plan. Today, this corridor is one of the hottest real estate markets in Prince George's County, and development pressure continues to grow north Rhode Island Avenue from the Rhode Island Avenue Metro Station all the way to the Capitol Beltway. The 2004 sector plan is almost completely reliant on its development district overlay zone. And this overlay zone and the mixed-use town center zones along this corridor increasingly stand as barriers to the redevelopment that the redevelopment pressure that the corridor is facing. Uh, when those uh, zones, uh, when the development district overlay zone is eliminated upon the implementation of the 2018 zoning ordinance, this outdated plan will be almost entirely obsolete with few specific recommendations guiding development. A new plan in SMA is required to meet the increasing demand for redevelopment along the Route 1 corridor, to bring the town of Riverdale Park into this conversation, and to mitigate as best as possible the potential displacement of current residents and surrounding neighborhoods as redevelopment occurs. This plan would be coordinated, of course, with the adjacent Port Town sector plan, which uh, an area that faces similar development pressures that are increasingly coming uh, north from the District of Columbia to ensure that both plans are consistent with each other. Next slide. In fiscal year 2026, uh, we hope to initiate a sector plan and sectional map amendment for the East Capitol Street corridor uh, between the Capitol Heights and Addison Road local trans, uh, excuse me, the Capitol Heights and Addison Road metro stations. 
Uh, these are designated local transit centers within Plan 2035, uh, and this will provide a coordinated vision uh, for both stations um, in close coordination with the District of Columbia to facilitate unified vision goals, policies, and strategies that will revitalize the town of Capitol Heights and the city of Sea Pleasant, capitalizing upon the, uh, in the development potential of the two metro stations. Um, the county executive has recently identified this as one of her top priorities, and we hope that we, as we continue to coordinate with the, the county executive on the, these efforts, uh, there'll be opportunities in, in the intervening years to test some market strategies out and, and to see, uh, to have a really good idea of what the market is along the Maryland 214 and Blue and Silver Line corridors. Um, and that will inform any kind of land use or zoning changes that are necessary in this area. Uh, the 2008 approved Capital Heights Transit District Development Plan is, uh, contains very few policies and strategies on its own and is obviously as a TDDP overly dependent on its transit district overlay zone, which is going away with the new zoning ordinance. Uh, the approved Subregion 4 Master Plan makes recommendations for Addison Road uh, that were predicated on rezonings that would be pursuant to the soon to be defunct subtitle 27A, uh, which never occurred. So it's time for a new plan for these two stations. Um, and the result of not having a plan for Addison Road um, in particular over the last few years has been quite a bit of development that uh, is, is not oriented to the station necessarily, or is not necessarily transit supportive. Um, and uh, some missed opportunities that could occur there. We hope to uh, take advantage of uh, a new planning effort to identify what those opportunities might be. A uh, critical location, for those of you familiar with the corridor, cr critical location uh, in, in this plan is the Addison Plaza Shopping Center. Uh, new developments are in the entitlement process currently that could prove catalytic uh, to attract new development. Um, and we think that proactive planning and zoning is necessary to ensure that the development that occurs along this corridor is contact sensitive uh, and provides appropriate transition to existing neighborhoods and guards against socioeconomic displacement. Next slide, please. The next project in this, in this uh, program is a new sector plan for the Maryland 414 Oxon Hill Road and Maryland 210 Indian Head Highway corridors. Uh, this, is an, this is an area that's facing increasing and in some ways unanticipated development pressure from the success of National Harbor and MGM. Um, there are new development opportunities uh, or at least there's new development interest that's popping up along both corridors and the plans for this area really don't anticipate them. Um, the, it, the, Oxon Hill Road Corridor is subject to the 2006 master plan for the Henson Creek South Potomac planning areas, which in turn is predicated on an extension of the Purple Line or extension of Metro across the Woodrow Wilson Bridge that is not anticipated in the near or mid terms. Um, and so a new plan is necessary to kind of right size those recommendations. Also that plan uh, is predicated like the Port Towns plan on a significant amount of parcel assembly uh, for those of you familiar with the Oxon Hill Road corridor, there are a lot of small uh, commercial parcels that host relatively successful businesses. And so we don't believe that parcel assembly is it, along huge swaths of that corridor is, is, is really viable or feasible. We need to identify uh, another alternative. How is the redevelopment of uh, Rivertown Commons going to affect the neighboring properties? What opportunities and going to continue to emanate um, westward from National Harbor, from the outlets. Um, and what are those impacts on the 210 corridor heading north towards the District of Columbia? Um, we did a sector plan in 2014 for East Over Forest Heights and Glass Manor, but that sector plan, plan was really predicated on three development possibilities along that corridor and didn't integrate well with the surrounding communities and surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, so we hope that one plan for this entire area can bring all of those different factors together um, and create a destination and a gateway into Prince. I know that's a term that's been used a lot lately, but a gateway into Prince George's County across the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Um, this is a plan that would start in fiscal year 2027. Next slide. 
these plans we think are uh, the start of, of course, multiple years of, of plans as we update all 38 master plans around Prince George's County. Uh, the list of the plans that we presented today are here uh, for you to review. Um, we're, we're really excited to get a lot of these started and to complete the plans that we have underway we'll, that we'll be bringing to you in the coming years for adoption. Uh, that concludes staff's presentation. Uh, do you have any questions of us? Um, first of all, thank you, Mr. Rowe, and thank you, Ms. Reiser. Um, and I will see if the board has any questions for you. This is very comprehensive, and it's a good work pro pro program. As we were going through the written materials last night, in addition to the PowerPoint, um, it, it, it looks it's a viable approach. Um, when when we get so many more requests throughout the year, um, but right now this is a, a viable approach, and we hope it can we can stay the course here. Sometimes uh, we have council members who want to change things, but um, right now this is a very, very viable plan. Um, let's see if uh, we have any questions. Madam Vice Chair? No questions, but thank you for the information. Commissioner Washington? Uh, no questions, and I too thank you for the information and presentation. Nice job. Yes. Um, Mr. Dorner, Commissioner Dorner? Yeah, thank you as well for the presentation. Um, do you have any notion of like what might be some of the potential changes because of the COVID environment? If that kinds of kind of changes some of the development styles, um, what we've been hearing kind of on the construction side from um, builders is that folks are across the country going out to more suburban kind of areas. I have a feeling that's probably just the land assembly issue that you're talking about um, and the lack of vacant parcels. Um, but there's also been some push on multifamily to not have elevators and to have like fewer communal spaces um, because of concerns of COVID. I don't know if that's going to last, um, depending on how quickly the vaccine comes out and, and, and hopefully goes away. But do you have any, any idea of where there might be shifts? I, I would say that we haven't seen, I, I don't, we haven't seen really the impacts yet. And, and I would, I would note that the information I have is the same that everyone else has, which is largely anecdotal. There's a lot of media coverage about this abandonment of cities and this drive to move to the suburbs. And it's they're interviewing one or two families that made that choice and a suburban real estate agent. So I haven't seen that. It's too early to tell. I think we're still seeing a lot of entitlement activity um, in both Prince George's County and other jurisdictions around the region that doesn't reflect a change. Some projects are on hold, but some projects are advancing. Uh, projects that are already construct are under construction kind of have to continue. Um, and it, it remains to be seen. Um, you know, we've had uh, pandemics before in this country and they haven't changed uh, the large demographic preference changes and where people want to live, work and play. Um, and so it remains to be seen what the impacts will be here. I think that um, if, if there's uh, any change, we won't see it for a couple of years, unfortunately. Um, so in the meantime, um, you know, I think that the, the best we can do is, is continue to monitor that. Um, but uh, I think that there's a, there's a good chance that once the pandemic ha has been mitigated and that uh, we kind of have a semblance of, of normalcy that we'll get back to the continued generational shifts in the real estate market. I think where the biggest impacts will be, and you're already seeing that is with the Class A office. Um, there was our, we, Prince George County was already struggling mightily in Class A office market, but now um, our strongest office markets, Tyson's Corner, downtown DC, um, the, the rest in area, everyone is seeing reduced interest in, in office space as most of your major corporations are, are uh, just, they're embracing the telework environment and, and they're not looking to go back at the, at the size and strength that they were before. So that's something we'll definitely keep an eye on. And uh, often when that happens, uh, we're seeing increased opportunities of you, as, as you all have seen through development activity recently in office to residential conversions. Um, I think as far as the discussion, like you brought up Commissioner Garner about not having elevators and things like that, I think that the construction industry um, and the development industry is looking for ways to make multifamily 
and two family, three family products more um, safe from a uh, health perspective rather than abandoning them as possible development types. Um, I think that's that's where they'll go. And if that doesn't work, then, then of course the market will have to evolve. But um, stay tuned because it's it's uh, we we just haven't seen yet, and you and you are continuing to see um, as normal development projects, and I think that will continue for a while. Yeah, yeah thanks for the comments. Um, to on the last sort of part on the two to three family kind of units, so we've started to see some two two over twos um, come into the county a little bit more. It'd be good if these plants could start to anticipate higher density along with the, the new land use um, code. That we're, we're hopefully going to get more infill development that will create higher density and, and put downward pressure on some of the, the lack of affordability that's starting to happen. Um, so to the extent that we can encourage higher higher density that, that doesn't have to go too high, but can be kind of infill development um, that can help keep these areas affordable and not result in gentrification or kind of pushing existing residents outward, um, that would be that would be ideal. But yeah, it's great. Yeah, great. I think that you know, to, to your point, that that's something that's being explored through the Housing Opportunities for All work group um, in trying to implement the county's comprehensive housing strategy. I, I know the council is aware of it, and and you know, anecdotally, we've been hearing through our focus groups and and community chats and in the Bowie plan and the West Heightsville Queens Chapel plan, um, uh, members of the community saying, you know, these are these are things we ought to be looking at, which has been which has been. A, a bit of a change from what we've heard in the past, so it's it, it's interesting to hear that perspective from the community. It's a good change. All right, well, thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Giraldo, give me your mic. You have to unmute. Uh oh. Okay. So I want I'd like to dovetail on on with Commissioner Dorner one with respect to the housing types, and I've raised this issue before. You know, I'm from the Northeast. Commissioner Hewlett probably is aware of it as well. She's from there. There's like Boston, New York City, New Jersey. You have traditionally three family houses, which I just don't see here. And besides helping with the density, what it also helps is or promotes home ownership because a person who buys it can live on one floor and rent out the other two floors and helps, helps pay for the mortgage. So what consideration has been uh, with that, with that, if any. So it's an ongoing conversation with the county, with, with the county council as we do the plans. Uh, I know they're looking at um, opportunities to increase housing affordability, and there's a lot of discussion going on with that. Um, one one approach that we took um, in the East Riverdale Beacon Heights sector plan that we that we approved in 2017 was where you have vacant lots in the middle of a neighborhood that's zoned R55, uh, recommending upzoning that to uh, RSFA, um, the attached uh, dwelling unit zone, um, to provide opportunities where you could have previously had one house, maybe you can have two, maybe you can have three, maybe you can have a, a, two, a couple two over twos. Again, the, the, the impact of adding two or three dwelling units to a block is is not it's not as um challenging as, as some of the community might think obviously it has to be balanced with uh, a, a a rational parking strategy because in a lot of communities around the county that are in the r55 zone they also were created with very small streets and they weren't anticipating having three four five cars in a household so that's something that we always look to mitigate but that's one approach that we took that that while we're waiting for um, a more comprehensive strategy, a zoning strategy or planning policy to come out of, of that work on the housing opportunities for all partnership. Um, it, it's, it's one step that we took that, uh, you know, very targeted could, could help increase the housing supply and uh, create new opportunities. So uh, to follow up on that, I, uh, if you go to Newark, New Jersey, they had a lot of empty lots uh, and because of some of the manufacturing uh, was was eliminated. And what's pretty typical, especially in the ironbound area, is where they built three family houses and the lower level or the first level 
with two car garages and which was one of the ways that they resolved some of the parking on the street problem. So it might be something good for, for our state to go up there and look at it and see how they've accomplished that. Because, you know, it's an older ur urban area that uh, uh, had, had vacant property, a property that was no longer utilized, and they couldn't use it for, um, uh, for any other type of manufacturing. So that might be uh, something for the staff to consider, to look at it. Hi, this is uh, Kip Reynolds with Community Planning. I did want to note that in the FY22 proposed budget, we're proposing to do a missing middle housing pattern book to sort of uh, look at those issues and encourage infill development with different styles and sort of look at it from an architectural um, perspective. So that will be proposed, and I think that will sort of work dovetail with the Housing for Opportunities um, all plan to sort of identify and really encourage this new housing types with the new zoning code to show people what can be done um, to accommodate you know that missing middle housing that we that we think we need in the county thank you and the second uh, i'm sorry i also just uh after you just want to let you know that brian barnett woods is on the call and we'd like brian just to talk a little bit about the mpot update because it is such a major project for the department and it will take several years so um That's, i will get off now thank okay thank you Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Um, I'm hoping we can um, hear Mr. Barnett Woods now. Uh, we, we did call him a little earlier. Oh, hi, good morning. Uh, Wonderful. This is, this is Brian, do you hear me? Yes, we hear hi, you now, thank you. Um, okay, great. Um, so yeah, thank, thank you, uh, thank you for, for that. Um, yes, uh, so we in the presentation, um, we didn't skip over the impact, but uh, because it's not a future fiscal year project, it, it didn't get a slide like um, the resource conservation plan. But, this plan will replace the, the 2009 countywide master plan of transportation, and in doing so, it will essentially amend all of the county's approved and active area master plans as well. Um, plan from George's 2035, the approved general plan, recommends updating the, the MPOT after 10 years. And so this plan will, will update and comprehensively develop goals and strategies and policies to really better implement plan 2035. And so, you know, Plan 2035 and what we envision is a plan that sees really a countywide transportation system that not only supports uh, safe, equitable, multimodal transportation um, for, for people and goods in the county and then through the region, but also a transportation system that supports and encourages the kind of economic and cultural and social activity that Plan 2035 envisions for the county, um, especially in those Plan 2035 centers. Um, we're hoping to use this plan to, to reassess the, the policies and recommendations of the 2009 Master Plan of Transportation to evaluate existing and propose new county rights of way, um, look at the scenic and, excuse me, scenic and historic road designation, identify transit corridors, pedestrian facilities, and bicycle corridors. Um, we're really going to use this plan to follow a multimodal approach um, and to use our, our department's transportation forecast model so it's really discuss and address county county traffic congestion and, and future transportation needs. Um, and as I think Scott mentioned earlier, we're currently kind of in the, the scoping phase of this project. Um, and so we're identifying the, the tasks that we can do in-house and things that we'll have to get uh, contractor assistance for. But that's all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barnett Woods. Um, so Mr. Rowe, was that it for you? For the oh, team. that was it. I just wanted to, okay. I just wanted to echo what Mr. Barnett Wood said. Like, okay. We are really excited about this opportunity to update the MPOT because the street really is where you know, where activity occurs in our centers, yes. and we, we think this is a great opportunity to create that infrastructure and create that framework for a pedestrian friendly environment that attracts people to different places in Prince George's County. And so it's a great opportunity to update all 38 of our master plans at once. Uh, and I wanted to uh, acknowledge Commissioner Geraldo's uh, recommendations. Uh, I worked in Newark for five years and very familiar with the housing types that, that, that you're talking about. And I also wanted, wanted to thank you for your recommendation to staff take a field trip there as it has been a long time since I've had a good revisio and I need to get that. <laughs> so, um, thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, let the record reflect that Commissioner Geraldo suggested staff takes a field trip to Newark. I, 
I um, think it'd be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, that concludes our presentation, Madam Chair. I do have one other question, Madam Chair. Okay. And, and it goes along with uh, when we're talking about the, the infrastructure, the roads and everything. With this, with this pandemic, I've been doing a lot more walking. And one thing that I've noticed is that many of the sidewalks in the county are exceptionally narrow and are not conducive to social distancing. So I was wondering what consideration can be given to require when new sidewalks are installed, instead of being three feet or four feet, maybe going to five or six feet. Uh, and that'll promote two things, the social distancing, and at the same time, um, encouraging you know the healthy and wellness of the county residents. Hi, good morning. This is uh, Brian Barnett with the Transportation Planning. Um, excellent question and observation. Um, I myself am a huge fan of, of wide sidewalks. Um, so a few things. Um, so uh, three feet and four feet, these are standard sidewalks from a long time ago. And the current standards are the minimum is five feet. Um, and we start calling sidewalks wide um, at, at six feet. Um, in our um, in Plan 2035 centers, uh, we like to recommend that, um, that DPI and Public Works implement what are known as the, the urban street standards um, that uh, the Department of Public Works and Transportation approved two or three years ago. And in those, uh, the minimum is, is six feet, and in many cases, um, it goes up to eight or 10 feet, and they are shared use paths, um, which we commonly refer to as side paths. The, the minimum is 10 feet, and the recommended uh, width is, is 12 feet. Um, and so we want to continue and make sure that our plan um, reinforces those kinds of recommendations um, for pedestrian mobility. Um, you know, so minimum, you know, we want to really start seeing wider sidewalks because it's, you know, it's one thing if you're walking very south, but of course if you're social distancing or if you're walking and you're pushing a stroller or holding the hand of a child or just walking side by side with a friend, um, it's much more pleasant and you know, an encouraging experience if you can do so side by side and not have to constantly shift your position to, you know, um, let people pass by. And, and, and I agree with that. And I know that that in terms of that's in the urban area, but I was thinking about all these subdivisions that we have and the developments that they took me the, the social distancing and the wider sidewalks. That's where my focus was as well so, uh, most, most definitely uh, commissioner and um the the minimum county-wide is now five feet okay um and when we have plans and, and sector plans and area master plans that recommend wide sidewalks regardless of, of it being in a plan 2035 center um the, the planning department will recommend um or the will recommend at least a six foot wide sidewalk. okay thank you very much okay, okay. Th does that conclude the questions for today um, if so, let me take a moment to thank um, Mr. Rowe, Ms. Reiser, Mr. Barnett Woods, and Ms. Reynolds um, for the presentation today. I think this is a very, very good plan, and we're off to a great direction. Um, and so, um, and I'm going to keep these. Um, so, thank you. Can I mention? Oh, okay. Can I mention for your break? Can you mention what? Can I just uh, mention one other thing for for staff to look into? Okay. Um, so if, if you go over as, as a local field trip over to the Cape Roots, um Development Offer Route 1, since that is one of the areas that, that you'll be looking at later on, um, they've done a really good job at kind of reclaiming the street in a semi-urban area. Um, and they've taken over kind of some of the parking spaces and put out tables out there. And it makes for a very nice urban environment. Um, and, and if you can replicate that kind of a thing in some of the plans, that would be extremely attractive um, for our county. Mm -hmm. That's it. We agree. Okay. Does that conclude questions for today? Again, thank you everybody for your great presentation and um, have a good rest of the day. We're going to go on with the rest of our development review items, but we appreciate the briefing. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so we've already started. We had a, a community. Um, 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 briefing this morning, um, community planning briefing, and that was very, very important to do that. And but now we're going to go to the development review items, and of course I have to make some some statements. Um, so the planning board, yes, 
Matthew. Yes. Before you begin, I, I, I'd like to ask for a point of personal privilege, please. Sure. Okay. Uh, it is well known that the Prince George's Planning Board is composed of outstanding local and national leaders. And today we pause to salute one of those leaders, Chair Hewlett, Hewlett who had not informed us of two outstanding recognitions she recently received. So I'm taking a point of personal privilege to share with everyone that the Maryland Department of Planning recognized and celebrated Chair Healy this week. She was named and featured in the Census Maryland 2020 newsletter as a census champion for her efforts to make a difference in Maryland's complete count and her advocacy efforts within Prince George's County and the Washington metropolitan region. Beginning in 2019, her year-long speaking tour has included presentations to residents, community groups, local and regional, national and elected government officials, faith leaders, secondary and higher educational leaders, business owners, and she stopped and talked to everybody about census, whether they wanted to hear it or not. <laughs> Here, Hewitt was selected also and featured in the Women in Planning series, part five, in the Planning Practice Monthly e-newsletter of the Maryland Planning Blog. In celebration of the State of Maryland's 2020 Year of the Woman, the Maryland Department of Planning has published a historical contribution of women that shaped the planning profession as well as our communities. You can read more about Chair Hewlett in the beautifully written article on the MarylandPlanningBlog.com. And she did not want this announced, but I am announcing it. And again, congratulations to Chair Elizabeth Betty Hewlett. Thank you for hey. and Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And look at that lovely picture. Uh, <laughs> that is. So, uh, thank you, Vice Chair Bailey. Y'all are sneaky, okay? So I, you know, every time I think I'm slipping in these surprises, you all have like, you know, you all have, it's like the big payback, as James Brown would say. But thank you very much for that lovely recognition. Um, and you were right, and somehow I just can't control our Madam Vice Chair. So, so but thank you very, very well, much. Well, you did not want it announced, but that's okay. You yeah, got it in. I did. I, I didn't. You're right, but that's okay. Thank you so much. But I have, you know, I had just have a great team. I have a great team. Um, I have a great census team. I have a great team with, with um, Park and Planning Commission, the great planning board. And I think we accomplish things together, and we are all in this together. So, thank you so very much. And now I'm going to go back to my other announcements. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the, um, we are already in session uh, for the October 1st, 2020 um, and, um, meeting. And in an abundance of caution, this is the Planning Board's 22nd virtual meeting since March. 22nd. Um, I'm going to go through the participation guidelines for our hearings just so that everybody will remember. But the most important thing is that effective this week, this week, all participants must pre-register and all materials or exhibits must be submitted by 12 noon, by 12 noon on the Tuesday before the Thursday planning board meeting as shown on the screen. And this is announced weekly in our planning board meetings. It's on, depicted on the screen and it's posted on our website. So we, you know, there should be no excuses. Everyone should know 12 noon on the Tuesday before the Thursday planning board hearings. Um, um, okay, and then, well, of course, the public may continue to watch planning board meetings streamed live, or if you wish to become a person of record, you may sign up online, um, and, and please note the screen for instructions. As always, we uh, commence um, with a moment of silence, and within our commission family, we want to remember Barbara Lesko, who was a former commission employee, a former colleague with the Department of Parks and Recreation Special Programs Division. Um, she just retired in May of 2020 after 40 plus years of service and, and she was celebrated during this COVID environment with a drive-by parade and she just, she passed away last Wednesday. So we want to remember her. And Melvin Harris, who is the brother of our own Rose Harris, who was also with the Department of Parks and Recreation, our uh, Maintenance and Development Division. We want to remember the victims, the ever-growing victims of the widespread coronavirus 
uh, more than 7.2 million cases and over 206,000 deaths in the United States alone. These are human beings. These are someone's, these are loved ones. Um, so we want to remember them and, and heaven knows we want to put a stop to the spread of the um, COVID. Sterling McGee, a um, blues guitarist, musician, and singer. Guadalupe Shore Ortiz, Ortiz, um, age 78, Teano, musician, and singer. Jay Johnstone, former uh, Major League Baseball outfielder, a two-time World Series champion with the Dodgers and the Yankees. Okay, many of us will remember Helen Reddy, um, Grammy-winning Australian singer known for her global hit, I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar. And she was the subject of the 2019 biopic of the same title. Barbara Bushman, aged 89, pioneering baseball announcer, and she was the first woman to broadcast a Major League Baseball game for Kansas City um, in 1964. Tony Tanner, um, choreographed and directed Broadway's uh, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Uh, he was the um, actor and director. Um, Joseph Laurentis, um, legendary pro wrestler known as Road Warrior, An Road, da, 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 Road Warrior Animal. He was one half of the tag team Road Warriors. Mac Davis, legendary country singer and songwriter who wrote A Little Less Conversation for Elvis Presley. W.S. Blue Holland, a longtime drummer for Johnny Cash. Larry Wilson, the former safety with the NFL St. Louis Cardinals. And there may be more, um, but and of course we extend our deepest sympathy to any of you in our actual uh, um, audience or in our listening audience um, or who are here who may have lost a loved one as well. Our hearts go out to you and to those who may be um, sick during this time. If we may have that moment of silence, please. Thank you so much. Okay, so th today is the first day of October. Happy October, everyone. We are still, we're halfway through Hispanic Heritage Month, um, which will continue through October uh, 15th. So we continue to celebrate people of uh, Hispanic Latinx um, culture um, and ethnicity. Um, it is Italian American Heritage Month in October, and it is Polish American Heritage Month. You know, one thing about the commission, we embrace diversity, we embrace everyone, so we want to celebrate um, the culture of our diverse um, um, commission um, uh, system and also the Prince George's County as well. It is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, ladies. You know what you have to do. And, and it, frankly, it's not l limited to women because men can get breast cancer too. It is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, domestic violence is horrific and it is on the rise, um, particularly during this COVID environment where people are quarantining at home. So that um, we, we really want to eradicate domestic violence. And in that same context, it is bullying, National Bullying Prevention Month. And lots of people bully. I'm going to stop there. But we shouldn't tolerate anybody bullying, no matter who they are or how grown they are. Um, it is Down Syndrome Awareness Month. Um, it is AIDS Awareness Month. It is National Crime Prevention Month, and in the midst of all these challenge, it, challenges, it is also Emotional Wellness Month, and we need to focus on that for our, our well, collective well-being. October 1st, 1868, Louisa May Alcott's Little Woman, Women was published in America, and it has been the subject of countless films as well. 1880, John Philip Sousa became the director of the U.S. Marine Corps Band. He composed several military marches, you know them when you hear them, including Semper Fidelis, the um, official march of the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, in 1888, October 1st, was the first publication of National Geographic. Um, 1903, October 1st, first baseball World Series game ever played. The Pittsburgh Pirates beat Boston. 1908, Henry Ford introduced the Model T, which sold for the price of $825. Don't you wish. Yes. 1833, Babe Ruth made his final pitching appearance in Major League Baseball. 1961, some of you of a certain age will remember when the Beach Boys recorded Surfing. 1962, a young, amazing vocalist named Barbara Streisand signed her very first recording contract. 1962, after successive court battles culminating with a Supreme Court decision um, in his favor, 
James Meredith became the first black student at the University of Mississippi. I talked about this earlier when he won his case, but entitling him to go to the state school in the state where he actually lived, because before that he was precluded. So that's when he became the first student in 1962, October 1st. Disney World opened 1971. 1975, the thriller in Manila took place in the Philippines, where Ali stopped Joe Frazier to retain his heavyweight title. Um, 1994. This was a historic moment when South African President Nelson Mandela visited the United States. I had my um, VHS at that time and I recorded that historic event and just moved me tremendously to see him after all that he endured in, in fighting apartheid um, in South Africa. And in 1999, national hockey great Wayne Gretzky's number 99 was retired. Okay, so Finally, October is National Seafood Month, National Chili Month, National Pizza Month, Sausage and American Cheese Month, and National Popcorn and Poppin' Month. So there's a lot of food for us to enjoy this month. And with that, I'm going to go on to the um, budget forums. We have, we're holding our budget forums virtually this fall. The public is invited to provide comments. Um, and the, the sec we already had one. Uh, but the second and last virtual forum will be on Tuesday, October 13th at 7 p.m. as depicted on the screen. And written comments may be submitted until the close of business on October 27th. So to sign up to speak, you can submit your comments and visit uh, PG, pgplanningboard.org. Um, the planning department. Okay. Planning Department, save the date. The West Hyattsville Queens Chapel Sector Plan kickoff meeting will be Saturday, um, October 17th at 10.30 a.m. Residents, property owners, and stakeholders will learn about the upcoming sector plan for the areas surrounding West Hyattsville, including portions of Hyattsville, Mount Rainier, and um, uh, Brentwood, and opportunities to participate in the planning process. So see the slide for details and the web address. Finally, um, two more things. Grab and go. Grab and go meals are provided for seniors ages 60 and better, 60 and better, and individuals with disabilities all ages. And they are now, uh, we, we had them every, daily, but now they're going to be Wednesdays, um, October the 7th and October the 21st from noon to 2 p.m. The distribution sites are listed on the screen. Beltsville Community Center, Camp Springs Senior Activity Center, uh, Gwendolyn Britt Senior Activity Center, Johnny Howard uh, Senior Activity Center, Prince George's Sports and Learning Complex, the Wayne K. Curry Sports and Learning Center, and Southern Area Aquatics and Recreation Center. Um, this is how you register as depicted on the screen. And finally, the, the deadline for the census was September 30th, um, 2020. The, a federal court ruled that the uh, deadline could not have been summarily changed from, um, from October 31st to September 30th. So um, it struck it down, th that deadline down. The U.S. Census Bureau has indicated now that self-response will continue to October the 5th. So there's only four more days. Self-response. But the enumerators will continue go knocking door to door through October the 31st. So please get your census um, uh, response completed. Everyone, please, because this means so much money, so many programs for Prince George's County, and we need these. We cannot deprive ourselves. So you can go to my2020census.gov, tell all your friends, everybody who is watching needs to text 10, tell 10, count 10 at least, so to make sure our numbers go up. And finally, um, could, we want to do a special congratulations to our Park Police Chief, Prince George's County Division, Stanley R. Johnson. He was awarded the Purple Light Bulb Award from the Prince George's County Sheriff's Department because, as I indicated, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and, the, and Chief Johnson and our Prince George's Division of the Park Police have been recognized by the Sheriff's Department for their partnership for their support, for their leadership in shining a light in the darkness where de domestic violence thrives. We need to shatter the silence. We have done shatter the silence walks so that the police, our police um, force has um, initiated some years ago and we can walk and we donate money to the domestic violence um, 
segment of the of our hospital system to just shatter that silence. So we just want to make sure that we um, do shatter the silence and we do commend Chief Stanley Johnson and our police department, our Park Police Department, for doing an outstanding job in trying to eradicate um, domestic violence. So can we give them a round of applause? So once again, we thank everyone, appreciate your flexibility, cooperation, and support as we continue to keep our planning functions moving forward in a safe fashion during our new normal. We ask you to make every effort to stay safe, to look out for one another, to stay strong, to take care of yourselves, to stay resilient, to stay woke. And despite these challenging times, we must, we must remain vigilant, committed, but ever hopeful as we strive to get through these times together. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to go, and that took longer than our case is going to take today. But anyway, we have our <laughs> consent agenda items 4A and 4C, um, which are resolutions. Um, is there a motion? Madam Chair, at the consideration of the records for items 4A and 4C, I move adoption of staff findings and approval of the items on the consent agenda in accordance with the recommendation of staff. Second. Second. We have a motion by Vice Chair Bailey, seconded by Commissioner Geraldo. Um, I see no discussion. Madam Vice Chair? But I. Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. Commissioner Washington? Aye. Commissioner Dorner? Good eye. The ayes have it 5 0. The next item is item 5, which is preliminary plan 4 19024 for the calm retreat. And I know that we have a request for a continuance, and I'm going to check to make sure we have our two people. Um, Mr. Sievers, are you on? Yes, ma'am. Present. Okay, wonderful. Mr. Tedesco, are you on? Morning, Madam Chair. I'm here. Okay, wonderful. Um, and uh, Mr. Villegas? Uh, he's not. He signed up, but he's not on this morning. Okay, um, because, because, Okay. got it. Okay, so um, Mr. Sievers, do you have any, you want to start? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, I am Thomas Sievers, Senior Planner with Subdivision and Zoning Section. Item number five on the agenda is Preliminary Plan of Subdivision 4-19024, Calm Retreat, consisting of 488 lots and 58 parcels for single-family attached dwellings in 20,000 square feet of commercial development. By letter dated September 28, 2020, the applicant's representative, Matt Tedesco, granted a waiver of the 70-day review period and requested a continuance to the planning board hearing date of November 12, 2020. If the, applica if the application is continued to November 12, 2020, no additional posting will be required. Staff recommends approval of the continuance. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Sievers. Mr. Tedesco. Uh, really no comments, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, good morning. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Sievers and Ms. Connor for their review of this application and their support for the continuance. We did um, send a copy of the request to all parties of record via email, um, so I'm hopeful that they, those were received. We would submit on the letter and respectfully request uh, your approval of the continuance to November 12th. Thank you, Mr. Tedesco. Uh, does, um, I need to see the board again. Let's see if there are any questions. I doubt it, but let's see. Madam Vice Chair? No questions. Okay. Um, Commissioner Washington? No questions. Okay. Commissioner Dorner? No questions. Commissioner Geraldo? No, no questions, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. I, there was no one else on the sign-up list to speak. So um, is there a motion to continue to Move. November 12th? Move approval to November Second. 12th. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Geraldo, seconded by Vice Chair Bailey, to continue this matter until November the 12th, 2020. Uh, Madam Vice Chair? But aye. Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. Commissioner Washington? Aye. Commissioner Dorner? Aye. Okay, the ayes have it 5-0. Mr. Hunt, this is a very important question. Mr. Hunt, are you on? Madam yes, Chair. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Geraldo. I don't know if you mentioned this today or not, but today is uh, former President Carter's 96th birthday. Oh, okay. Happy birthday to former President Carter, 96th <laughs> birthday. Thank you. Okay, so that's a, one, that's a nice statement. And now I'm going to my, my very profound question. Mr. Hunt, 
Is there, any, is there any additional business to come before the planning board today? There are no other agenda items before the planning board today. The planning board is adjourned. Thank you. Hey, see ya. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay, everyone, everyone take good care.